All right. Uh, well, this morning, I thank you guys for, for coming. Um, this, is, this is good. You guys, everybody good? All right. So this morning, I want, I want to talk to you about the faithfulness of God in the Christmas story. Um, and just a little bit of a, a disclaimer, my, my message title is a little bit deceiving because I'm never actually going to refer to any of the traditional Christmas passages, you know, the, the Matthew and, and the Luke. Uh, so if you came today hoping to hear those, I'm, I, I apologize. You won't be hearing those today, uh, but it's still going to be a really good message. It's blessed me. I think it's going to bless you. So we're going to start this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. We're one verse to start out. This is going to be Hebrews 10:23. This is what the writers of Hebrews said. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So let's go and pray before we get started. Jesus, I just uh, love you. I thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you loved us so much that you chose to leave just the throne of heaven to become a baby and to be born in a manger. Thank you for leaving the glory of heaven to come to earth. Thank you for choosing to come and to seek and save us that was lost. Jesus, we just love you. Holy Spirit, help me just to, to speak clearly what you've put into my heart and ask you to open up all of our hearts today just to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this entire Christmas season, um, I really felt stirred, unlike other Christmas seasons, to really spend a ton of time in the Christmas story. Uh, most Christmases, I don't really change up my devotional time very much. I just continue to read what I normally read. Um, how many of you know, like, is it just me or is it, is it easy to get numb to Christmas? Like, yes, feel that sometimes. Like, it's just, you know, it's just easy to get numb. You kind of lose the awe and the wonder and the message of Christmas. And so I kind of made a decision, like, I don't want to be that way this year. So I felt the Lord was like, well, just spend, spend time, like, in the Matthew and the Luke stories. And then do, and I felt led to really do just a ton of Christmas devotionals. I, I don't typically do a lot of devotionals, but I felt really led just to do a ton of just Christmas devotionals. For, so that's all I've done really for the past month or so. All my, my quiet time has been just mainly the Matthew and Luke, and then just lots and lots of Christmas devotionals. And honestly, it's been phenomenal. Next year for you guys, I'd recommend it. It's really helped me to stay really honestly in, in awe of the Christmas message. And, and I feel like I've had a lot more joy going into the season. Uh, but about three weeks ago, one of my devotions was this, this verse of scripture, the Hebrews 10, 10, 23. So I began to just meditate on this, the verse and specifically the last portion of it where he who promised is faithful. I began to think about just the faithfulness of God in our family this year, just to meditate on, on his goodness and his faithfulness to us. And you know, like a lot of you, we haven't had the easiest of years. Um, our year has been definitely easier than, than a lot of yours. But it hasn't been like the easiest for you. Of course, when you, when you have your daughter uh, move across the country to become a missionary, that's not the easiest thing. And then just personally, there's just a lot of just pruning and, and stripping away. And so anytime you have a whole entire year of that, I feel like it's not the easiest. But in the midst of it all, God remained faithful. And he's been faithful to you, right? Like in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of whatever's going on, you're here right now. Amen? Like you're here. Like you've made it. Like we're seven days away from 2024, so you've made it. Like God's been faithful to you. But in the midst of meditating on that, he spoke something to my heart that I want to share with you. And this is kind of where I want to center my message around. We're going to go from here. But he said something to me. He said, Mark, he said, Christmas is a demonstration of my faithfulness of all, to all of humanity. I'm going to say thank you. He said, Christmas is a demonstration of my faithfulness to all of humanity. You know, when most of us, like, we think about Christmas, we, we think about, of course, Jesus coming as a baby in Bethlehem in a manger. And certainly that's a portion of the story. But the idea of Christmas is so much more than that, right? The, the idea of Christmas is that God sent Jesus to seek and save us, to seek and save that which is lost. God sent Jesus into the world to destroy the works of the devil. That's the Christmas message. God sent Jesus into the world to reconcile the world back to the Father. That's the message of Christmas. So what the Lord began to speak to me and what he showed me, what I want to propose to you, is that the story of Christmas actually doesn't begin with Jesus being born as a baby in Bethlehem, that's actually the climax of the Christmas story. 
The Christmas story, actually the storyline of Christmas didn't start in Bethlehem. It actually started 4,000 years earlier in the Garden of Eden. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to go to to Genesis 3, 4,000 years before the manger. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? But the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. All right, so let's, let's just stop and let's, let's review what's happening here. Genesis 1 and 2, of course, God makes the earth. He forms everything. He creates Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are born into a perfect world. Adam and Eve are born sinless. There is no sin in them at all. And they get to walk in unbroken intimacy with the Father. It says that God came and he walked with them every single day. So they've lived in this place of intimacy with Father God. No sin in a perfect world. That's Genesis 1 and 2. So then we see Genesis 3. Of course, we know this as the story of the fall of man. To me, probably the most tragic and saddest story in all of the history of mankind. Adam and Eve, through, through one act, of course, rebel against God. They, they, take, they do the one thing that God says you cannot do. Commit treason against God. Give their obedience to the devil. They're turning the world over to him. So that's where we're at so far. But I want us to look at God's response to the story. We're going to continue in verse 8. It says, and the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your lives. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike, or you will bruise his heel. All right, so let's continue. So man has just rebelled against God, just done the one thing he said not to do. Sin has come into the world. Adam and Eve have turned the world over to devil. But what's God's response in this? God comes looking for them. God comes and he does the same exact thing he's done every single day of their existence. He comes to walk with them in the cool of the day. Let me ask you, did God know what had just happened? Right, he did, right? He's God. Like none of this took him by surprise. And he knew this day was coming. Like I I don't know how far along this is in the creation story, whether it's days, weeks, months, years. I don't don't know, but, but God knew this day was coming. In fact, he made a plan for it. It says in Revelation 13 that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, I, don't, I can't begin to understand how that works. Like, uh, my mind can't go there. But God had a plan in place from the beginning of the time to take care of this. So he knew this was going to happen. Yeah, even in the midst of what they just did, God goes looking for them. Like, we're talking about the faithfulness of God. Even in the midst of their sin... 
even in the midst of their brokenness, even in the midst of them messing everything up, for everyone, for all of the rest of time, God goes and looks for them. Why? Because he's faithful. That is the character and nature of God. God is faithful, and he cannot be anything other than faithful. Like in Malachi 3, this is what God says about him. He says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. That's really, really good news for us, right? Because if he went looking for Adam and Eve in the midst of their junk, in the midst of royally messing things up for every single one of us, he went and he found them in the midst of their nakedness and their shame, in the midst of their brokenness. Guess what? He'll do it for us too. And not only will he do it for us, he does it for us day after day after day after day, after day, for all of us. Why? Because it's, it's who he is. He, he can't be anything other than faithful. And not only did he go looking for them, I mean, we continue to read on, of course, he, he, he gives them the consequences of their sin. Of course, I, I, don't, I don't want it to make like, sound like he, he was just okay with what happened, because he wasn't. Right, he's God, like there's, there's always consequences to sin. He's never okay with sin. And so he gives them, of course, we know the, the list of all the things that are now going to happen as a result of their sin, all the things that women are going to have to experience, all the things that men are going to have to experience, all the things that you and I continue to live in every single day. He, so he tells them what that is. But what happens next? God makes clothes for them. Is that amazing? Like, like he could have just left them to their own devices, right? I mean, like he had every right to do that. They had just messed everything up. They, they, they caused sin to come in this perfect world. He could have just left them. Like, you, know, you know what, guys? You obeyed the devil. Go with him. Do whatever you want. But he chose not to do that, though. He actually makes clothes for them. That's amazing to me. So they, they, you know, they try to do it themselves. You know, so they, it says they, they sewed fig leaves together. So here, like they, out of their own works, they, they make this themselves. But what does God do? Like he gives the, like this, this is what's going to happen because of your sin. But then he, immediately he shows mercy. He covers their shame. He covers their nakedness. And it, and it makes me think of, Every one of us were, I don't know everybody in, in the room. So I don't know what your relationship with this God. I know the majority of you, and, and I know the majority of you, you were just like Adam and Eve. Like you were, you were lost in your sin. And God came looking for you. And God came pursuing you. And we all stood before God naked. We all stood before God in our shame. But the minute we said yes, just like these amazing men back here did, what does God do? He clothes us with the robe of righteousness. So we see God doing the same thing to Adam and Eve. Like it's amazing. Like it's amazing, like the faithfulness of God. All right, so let's keep going. We're going to get to the really, really good part. We're going to get to verse 15. Verse 15, this is what God says to the devil. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Can I, can I propose that this is the beginning of the Christmas story? Right, because Christmas is about God sending Jesus into the world. This, this, this term right here, this verse, uh, I found out, it, it's called the, the Proto-Evangelium. It, it means the first gospel. So here in Genesis 3.15, God himself is declaring not only to the devil, not only to Adam and Eve, but he's actually making a declaration to all of creation that there's coming a day. Christmas is coming when the offspring of a woman is going to come and is going to crush the head of Satan and redeem back every single thing that was lost and stolen. That is the story of Christmas, Right? So we see right here from the very beginning of time, God making to all mankind the promise of Christmas. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. 
He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. The good news is that God's faithfulness does not come and go. Like it is not based upon us at all. Like it's not based upon our goodness. It's not based upon anything we do. His faithfulness is who he is. It's his character. It's his nature. And he can't be anything else other than that. Remember, Christmas is a demonstration of God's faithfulness to you and to me. I want to shift gears uh, now. I want us to look at all the different scriptures that talk about the birth of Christ. So we see here from, from Genesis 3, for the next you know, several thousand years, God begins to tell his people about Christmas. He begins to weave all throughout the whole entire Old Testament all these prophetic promises about the coming of the Messiah. And again, it just shows his faithfulness and the length that he'll go to to save us. All right, Isaiah 7, 14. This Isaiah prophesies that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6. That he would come as a child, and the government will be on his shoulders. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 11, 1, Jesus will come from the line of Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Micah 5, 2, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Hosea 11, 1, the Messiah will come out of Egypt. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Jesus would come from the line of David. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Numbers 24, 17. This is the verse actually that most people believe the Magi used to know that they would be guided by a star. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. And it's like every single one of these were fulfilled. Actually, most believe that there was somewhere between 200 and 400 um, messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. And I want to read you something. Probably a lot of you have heard this. I know Ryan has, has read it in the past. I want to read this to you. It was a study that was done um, through a professor in college and a student. So it's a little bit lengthy. So stay, stay with me. Um, it's going to be good. You're going to be uh, blessed by it. Anyone can make predictions. Having those prophecies fulfilled is vastly different. In fact, the more statements about the future and the more detail, then the less likely the precise fulfillment will be. For example, what's the likelihood of a person predicting today the exact city in which the birth of a future leader would take place well into the 22nd century? This is indeed what the prophet Micah did 700 years before the Messiah. For the, what is the likelihood of predicting the precise manner of death that a new unknown religious leader would experience a thousand years from now? A manner of death presently unknown and to remain unknown for hundreds of years. Yet this is what David did in 1000 BC. Again, what is the likelihood of predicting the specific date of the appearance of some great leader hundreds of years in advance? This is what Daniel did 530 years before Christ. If one were to conceive 50 specific prophecies about a person in the future whom one would never meet, what's the likelihood that the person will fulfill all 50 of these predictions? How much less likely would it be if 25 of these predictions were about what other people would do to him that were completely out of his control? For example, how does someone arrange to be born in a specific city? How does one arrange to be born in a specified city in which their parents don't actually live? How does one arrange their own death, and specifically by crucifixion with two others, and then arrange to have the executioners gamble for his clothing? How does one arrange to be betrayed in advance? 
How does one arrange to have the executioners carry out their regular practice of breaking the legs of the two victims on either side, but not their own? How does one escape from a grave and appear to people after having been killed? Indeed, it may be possible for someone to fake one or two of these prophecies, but it would be possible for any one person to arrange and fulfill all these other prophecies. The science of probability attempts to determine the chance that a given event will occur. A professor at Westmont College has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah. These estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing 600 university students. The students carefully weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy at length, and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that men had conspired together to fulfill a particular prophecy. They made their estimates conservative enough that there was finally unanimous agreement even among the most skeptical students. However, the professor took their estimates, made them even more conservative, He also encouraged other skeptics or scientists to make their own estimates to see if his conclusions were more than fair. Finally, he submitted his figures for review to a committee of the the American Scientific Affiliation. Upon examination, they verified that his calculations were dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. For example, concerning Micah 2, where it states that the Messiah we were born in Bethlehem The professor and his students determined the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present. They then divided it by the average population of the earth during the same time period. They concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was 1 in 300,000. After examining only eight different prophecies, they conservatively estimated the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was 1 in 10 to the 17th power. So to illustrate how large, large of a number, that's 10 with 17 zeros. So the professor gave this illustration. If you mark one of 10 tickets, place all the tickets in a hat, and thoroughly stir them, then ask a blindfolded man to draw one, his chance of getting the, ticket, the right ticket is 1 in 10. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power, silver dollars, lay them on the face of Texas. They'll cover all the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up the one silver dollar that has a special mark on it. What would be the chance of him him choosing the right one? That was the same chance the prophets would have had of writing just eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time. From these figures, the professor concludes the fulfillment of eight prophecies alone. Uh, sorry, the fulfillment of eight prophecies alone proves that God inspired the writing of these prophecies, and the likelihood of the mere chance is only one in ten to the seventeenth. Another way of saying this is that any person who minimizes or ignores the significance of the biblical identifying signs concerning the Messiah would be foolish. Christmas is a demonstration of God's faithfulness to all of humanity. Excuse me, I got to, I'm sorry. Oh gosh, sorry. All right, I want us to go back to our starting verse, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know, in in the Greek, the, the term hold fast means to take possession of. And we know that hope means the confident expectation of good to come. So I want to read that verse again, just taking that. So let us read like this. So let us take possession of with a confident expectation of the good things that we were believing God for without wavering or doubting because God is always faithful to keep his promises. God is always faithful to keep his promises to me and to you. But the reality of that statement, though, takes a lot of faith. All right? It would be nice, it would be really, really nice if, if we could just take God at his face, face value and that everything we read in the word of God, every promise given to us, like we would just believe. That would be nice. All right? But most of like it takes faith to believe that he remains faithful to us. It takes faith to believe that he's going to fulfill every promise in the word concerning your life. Why? Because we have an enemy, right? 
We have an enemy that wants to do and tries to do and does do the same thing that he did to Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago. Like the same exact thing, the same way he tempted them, the same lies and deceptions that he did, he does the same thing to you and I every single day. But what did he say to Eve? Did God really say? And see, like if you think back, like think back of this past year, all the struggles, like all the different things that you went through this year. I can guarantee that for the majority of us in here today, that the struggle, the, the largest and hardest struggle wasn't the health issues. That the, the hardest struggle wasn't maybe the finances or, or, the, or the relational or the marriage or whatever those issues may be. The, the, probably the hardest struggle you had was to believe, did God really say? Like, will God keep his promises to me? Is he actually really good? Because what happens is the enemy comes. Did God really say that by his stripes you'll be healed? Because it doesn't really look like that. And did God really say that he would provide all of our needs? Because, because I'm, if I'm looking at what I have right now, like it doesn't look like that at all. So honestly, for most of us, that is, that is the battleground right there is will we choose to believe God over everything else? And then we live, in, we live in a world, right, that's constantly distracting us and constantly pulling us away from the love and the presence of God and wants to, God kicked out of every single aspect of our lives. Right? The, this world wants to us, there actually is no God at all. And this is the world that we live in every day. But for me, may, may, maybe not for you, but for me, honestly, the hardest struggle is, is me. Like it's myself, I can guarantee that most of us in here right now, you're living with unmet expectations of what you feel like God should have done and should be doing in your life right now. I can about guarantee that most of you probably have, have a list of prayers in your life that have not been answered. I know I do. I know we as a family do. And what can happen if we're not careful is, is we begin to build a case against God. As, as, these, as all these unmet expectations happen in our life and all these unanswered prayers, we, we begin, and we would never say it out loud, but we build this expectation, we build this case like, God, you're, you're not really faithful. And God, you actually, you don't keep your promises because if you did, then X, Y, and Z would look differently in my life today. All right, it, it, is, that, is that tracking with you guys? But like, if we're honest, like we really need to be like, like my, my lack of answered prayers, my, my lack of whatever it is in my life, it does not negate the faithfulness of God, right? It, it does not negate the fact of, of the, the promises of God are yes and amen. Like it doesn't matter what my life looks like. He is faithful regardless. Like whether I, even if I never see another prayer in my life answer, like I don't believe that's his will, but if I never see that again, like it doesn't mean he's not faithful, right? It doesn't make his word any less true. I want to, I want to close with one last verse. This was, actually, actually I am reading some for the Christmas story. This is Luke 1. This is 30, verse uh, 36 and 37. This is, when, this is when Gabriel has just come to Mary and, and he's telling her what he wants to do through her. And, and, he's, and he's telling her this. And then he, then he tells Mary, this is what just happened to your, your aunt Elizabeth. He says, and listen, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is now the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 37, for with God, nothing is ever impossible and no word from God shall be without power or possible of fulfillment. God is faithful. Like he is faithful. And Christmas, like Christmas tomorrow, like shows us his faithfulness to myself, to you and to the rest of the world and just shows like the wisdom of God throughout the thousands of years to make Christmas happen.